So this next session is slightly different. Um, Greg is bringing in a panel of Aussians, and I'll give you a chance to ask this panel a set of questions. So Greg Seipold is Director of Quality Engineering at Gannett, which owns USA News Today Network. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Greg and his panel. Awesome. Thanks for everybody coming. I am trying something new here. I'm hoping this works. Um, Slido is on the very bottom here, so like you can vote on the questions I kind of put out there, but I'm going to pick on the audience and walk around, and I'm going to have you ask these four panelists to answer the questions. It's kind of like, it could be like a roast, or I don't know. We're going to have fun with it. Um, if I really like your question, I have some sauce swag. I have like three jackets. They're supposed to be pretty cool. So, some, so make the questions interesting, right? So to kind of get started, I'm going to be a moderator. I'm going to walk around, and I'm going to kind of start here with Mia to introduce yourself and who you work for, and what's your favorite thing at the conference so far? All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Mina, and I work for Sony PlayStation. To be specific, cloud gaming and service PlayStation now. I'm a senior software developer in test. Um, I actually loved, uh, you know, the variety in, in SASCON this, this time. There was so much. There were MI, AI. There was, like, a uh, lot of different things that I got to learn. So it was, it was pretty amazing. I really, really uh, loved it. Yeah. Phil? I'm Phil Merwin, and I work for CBT Nuggets. And I'm a um, QA automation engineer and um, been at CBT Nuggets for about two years. Prior to that, I was at Symantec for 18 years as an automation engineer. So um, my favorite thing about Sauce this year is the uh, screener being acquired by Sauce Labs, because we just did a contract with Screener like two weeks ago. So that was pretty cool, and I got to meet Loyal, and he's a cool dude. Yeah. We may have some questions for you in a little bit. <laughs> OK. Isha? Hi, my name is Isha. I work for TrueCar as a software engineer. Uh, and uh, for SauceCon, yesterday the food trucks were really great. The party was awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that was the favorite part. Also, the keynote presentations were really good. A lot of inspirations from the uh, you know, uh, presenters. So yeah. Hi, I'm Alan Ark. I work at Duo Security currently. Uh, I've been in the software business since the early 90s. I've done load testing, front-end testing, API testing, 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 testing. Um, right now at Duo, we're working on a, a bunch of different teams trying to make the life experiences of employees for their employers very secure, as secure as possible, and to make it easy. Uh, my, one of my favorite things about attending conferences, at SauceCon in particular, is, is the people. There's so many good people here, uh, meeting a lot of new people and uh, seeing some old friends. So that's always a fun thing to have. Thank you. So I've seen about 28 people vote on some of the questions we threw out there. Um, you may have other questions. So I'm actually going to start. Rather than they know what the pre-questions are, I'm just going to pick someone in the audience. <laughs> and then you can raise your hand, or I'll just comment. If you're not paying attention, we're going to ask a question. <laughs> so if you're very uncomfortable, let me see here. Oh, we got one. Uh, question to Mina. So, um, so since you work at Sony PlayStation, I'm I'm kind of a gamer myself. So uh, I just, I, I'm a, I'm a tester as well. So I've never worked in a gaming platform before. So I just want to know how a typical testing process is done uh, in a company that develop, develops. I mean, works on a gaming platform. So, do manual testers get to play a lot of games every day? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I really was expecting that question. <laughs> uh, so I actually work for a cloud gaming service, like I said, PlayStation Now. So my job is basically doing a lot of back-end testing. Uh, but we do have QA uh, as well in, in, uh, in my team who actually does uh, play games, uh, you know, stream games, and definitely they do get to play a lot of games. And sometimes we also get to play games, you know, when we you know, launching something big, and we want to generate a lot of, you know, real-time data, and that time, we also get to play these kind of cool new games. So, yeah. 
Which really leads into my next question that everybody's voted on is like, it's really impossible to test all these things. And so for you, is how do you go about testing the right things and not all the things, especially from a gaming or like all your, so could all of you kind of explain in maybe 30 to 60 seconds is like how do you test like a video game console or a website? Um, so I really can't answer this question to be specific because I'm not into the console testing. I'm into cloud gaming service. So I can try to, you know, relate this question to what we do basically um, to uh, test. Um, so you said definitely we can't test everything, but it's, it's, it's um, I don't know how to answer it because you are asking about the console stuff. That's fine. Yeah. I think, Alan, you have experience yeah. of authentication. That, that has to be very interesting to what's the right level of testing yeah, it's always context specific, but in general, you really just want to start testing the things that changed. If you know something didn't change, I really wouldn't waste any time re-looking at that piece of functionality. But the hard part is, this piece of features came up and it's touching a little bit of this and a little bit of that. How do I know what tests are on? To get to the point where you're able to have a diff be posted and have tests automatically just be run in the right context, it takes a lot of discipline. Uh, some friends of ours uh, actually tried this and it worked for a little while, but as new engineers came on board, they weren't as disciplined with, uh, with just tagging all the tests correctly. But if you can understand the domain of the changes and we really focus your testing on those changes and the pieces that are affected by those changes, that's really where it is. But it comes down to what's the lowest level that you can test that, right? If you have a feature and you have tons of unit tests, that makes everything really easy. But in lieu of that, <coughs> then you start looking at the next level of maybe some integration tests. And then sometimes you have to look at a staging area or sometimes testing in production. Um, it really depends on your application, how mature your business is to figure out what needs to get done. The best thing you can do is start asking questions. Talk to people inside your company. Hey, I got these ideas. What do you think? Get other people involved. Really make the other people in the groups know what you're thinking of, ask for their opinion, and then work together to find out what the solution is for you guys. I'm walking around, oh God, I don't know if I want to get him. He works for me. So writing a lot of code, and specific to the code, sometimes you stay busy in the code, but managers, upper level management, want some insight into what you're doing. How many tests did you run? What's the percentage pass fail? Um, do we have any bugs, you know? How many tests are you running per week? Um, do any of you have any good uh, providers or any dashboards that you guys have? Yeah. For many that uh, mm -hmm. displays that, so you can just send it to we, them quickly. We just built and released what we call a test run manager, and it gives visibility into all of our tests to anyone. So anyone in the company can go and see what's happening on our stage environment, our QA environment, or a dev environment in real time. And we have our service tests and our front end tests are all collected there. Yeah, we do have similar dashboard as well for lower environment as well as production environment. And you kind of see how, how much percentage of test cases are actually passing, failing. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. We build our own, uh, we have reporting application where we have statistics for each uh, test run. So whenever a test uh, job is run, uh, we collect the statistics for those uh, test runs and give them uh, a dashboard view of like how those tests are doing with uh, uh, graphs of like average time, uh, when did they fill, what build they filled with, uh, and also like giving the overview of like in which environment they fills, and also like a filtering of those dashboards like in which environment, which tests with tagging. Also, those kind of dashboard really helps them understand like how the tests are doing. Yeah. So you see the theme here. Yes, use dashboards. <laughs> yes. yes gather those numbers. But the thing is, when you're going through and gathering the metrics, they have to be easy to gather. If it takes someone a day or two to manually get all the numbers to create a report, 
maybe you should rethink about how you're gathering those metrics. If it's not easy, it's hard to maintain, and it takes time from other things. That's interesting. So I got a couple questions about here. I like this. How are you aggregating all that data? Oh, automatically. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that auto magic, right? So yeah. there are different ways that you can aggregate data. So for example, in my um, uh, organization, we use Google Analytics. We use you know, metrics, we use events, you know, we use, uh, started using Prometheus to uh, monitor and, you know, grab these data from production and then this is how you, you know, generate all these fancy graphs and make a trend out of it and see how your software is actually doing over a certain period of time, so. Excellent. I'm going to hand it off to another question. Hello. Um, I have a question which might be a little bit off topic, but, um, do you guys have experience doing like security testing and doing it automatically and maybe having that to be a part of the continuous integration and what kind of tool you might be using to do that or what kind of attacks you try to simulate? Thank you. Yeah, oh. so, so coming from a security company, it's, the, it's everybody's job. That quality is everybody's job. At Duo Security, everybody is part of the security group. Uh, we actually are kind of blessed. We have our dedicated AppSec team who actually does all of the security testing uh, for our apps. They are constantly being brought in to our feature teams because we have lots of questions for them. Like we want them to let us know if we're doing the right thing. So it's a combination of static analysis, looking at the code, using some tools. Um, I don't know exactly what our AppSec team does, but it is a very specialized uh, feature of testing where you want someone whose job is security testing. Uh, I've been to that other places where they say, hey, uh, we have two QA folks, and we want load testing and security testing and feature testing and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, well, pick one or two that are really important to you right now, and then we'll get on it. Uh, but the security testing, it's, it's really, it's, it's very large. There's a lot you can do, and there's lots of tools out there. As long as you're starting something with security testing, that, that's better than nothing. So to add into that, uh, in CI CD pipeline, there are a couple of ways you can actually do it. So like we do Bandit. Bandit is basically a tool that actually sees the, you know, um, the vulnerabilities in your Python code. That is one tool that we are actually using as a part of CI CD pipeline. The other thing is Claire tool. It is basically checks vulnerabilities in your app in a container if you are running anything inside your container. So basically you can, use these kind of tools in your CI CD pipeline, just, which is very quick. Like, you know, within seconds, you will find out, you know, basic vulnerabilities. Yeah, but one thing you have to keep in mind, though, too, is that if you are integrating a lot of open source third-party packages, you do have to keep an eye on security alerts that come from them. Because yeah. uh, you could run into a place where, like Heartbleed, right? That's not our fault, but that it turns to everybody's problem. <laughs> so you, you just have to keep on it. And it's a lot of diligence. That's kind of why we have a dedicated AppSec team. Thanks, guys. All right. OK, so my question, I think, is under the automating the right things. I'm curious, in your companies, how you decide uh, testing based on customer needs. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the time with Agile, you have user stories, uh, and you're trying to get features out. But how do you, what is the relationship with the customer, and how do you test things so that they don't get into, bugs don't get into production, and for delighting your customers? Yeah. Uh, so TrueCar is a uh, mostly consumer-based application. Uh, so it's really crucial for us to uh, have that quality uh, when we uh, release something. And uh, to make sure, like, we always identify, like, uh, you know, uh, critical path testing. Uh, we adopted CICD last year, and it's very important to have the feature releases uh, fast and with speed and quality, right? So we introduce a gatekeeper suite in our testing where all the test suites uh, which are critical to the application are injected into that suite, and we use tagging system for uh, tagging those tests as criticals, and we run those tests in our CICD pipeline, and we don't run all the tests during a CICD 
CD pipeline, and that covers the features and uh, uh, you know most uh, critical path for consumer that uh, all the functionality is tested correctly and all the integrations are working uh, so that the consumer is not. Uh, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, a bug or uh, encountering an issue where they are going from flow to flow. Yeah. Any of you looking at user data from like analytics to drive your testing strategy? We don't right now. Yeah. Anybody we in a room using analytics <coughs> to try to drive? Oh, we got one, two. <coughs> we should really understand our users. I, I, I'm a believer of like understanding how your users are at, at accessing your application. So that's kind of another place where you can kind of drive that strategy a little bit, for sure. Um, as a more senior, I'm, in my company, we a lot of our testing has been manual for the most time for user acceptance. Um, and I'm one of the more senior with a lot of domain knowledge. But as we transition to automation and hire more, uh, experienced automation engineers, I can feel some conflict with the way we've been doing things and how I'm trying to help bring them up to speed. Um, are there any suggestions you can make to uh, improve my own skills as well as help make the transition smoother for them um, so that I don't feel like I'm letting them down in some way as a more senior um, member of their team? Um, so. Testing is basically, you know, it's a journey. You learn a lot of things. I. Uh, I was a manual tester before. I went to automation testing, and finally, I'm a software developer in test. So I think you can relate this with me. Um, so there are certain ways that I've, uh, things that I've learned in my journey. The very first thing is, um, you know, visualizing this change, uh, you know, accepting the change that is coming in your organizational culture. Um, I think the way you can do is basically uh, think about uh, you know, your company has a vision, Have your department has a vision, is your team has a vision about achieving that quality. You know, this is how you feel quality in it. Um, the second thing which I, you know, suggest people is basically uh, talk about organizational culture. Um, I remember in one of the keynotes uh, from the um, Walmart labs, they were talking about more of organizational culture. They wanted to continue this organizational culture so that every software professional in your company becomes Sherlock Holmes, you know? So, uh, and proper training, of course. You want uh, a proper training to each level of your software professional so that they imbibe this organizational culture. Uh, the, the other thing is basically, um, you know, uh, evaluating your uh, quality or culture every time so that you, you, you see where you are heading, or if you are heading in the right direction or not. So in short, if, if I say uh, visualizing, you know, the vision, uh, motivation, empowerment, you know, having a great quality culture will push you towards the passion that you carry for testing. So uh, I'm sure you are doing amazing, and you'll do amazing, because uh, I think I'm doing OK. <laughs> uh, because it's a great journey, and yes. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. to add to that, uh, you can definitely give them the exercise and talk to them, like have the interview kind of round with them to understand their needs and to understand like what they are lagging, uh, catching up with automation, like having open forums, uh, having understanding of the automation with them, uh, writing tasks, giving them exercise to learn through uh, like the different tasks that you can uh, provide them that would really help. Yeah. Phil yeah. or Alan? Yeah, I wanted to, to chime in on this. I've been in a couple of places where I've been brought in as an automation engineer, and the rest of the QA group is, is not really super technical, right? And they're seeing this guy come in. He's going to automate the world, and my job's going away. That's what they're thinking half the time. You know? But I always try to send the message out, I'm not getting rid of your job. I'm letting you focus on things that are just more interesting. Like all this regression testing, taken care of. Things that can be a pain. Then thing that's like load testing, you can't do manually. But some, they did. They had like 50 people, got in a little watch. Everybody hit go, log in. That's the load test. I'm like, that's not really a load test. That's just, that's just luck. Right? 
But if people <laughs> want to move into automation, like they're manual testing and they want to move into test automation, well, all right, we can give them training, but at the same time, they have to devote the time. Not all the training is going to happen on the job, nine to five. Some of it's going to have to be on their own. And if they really want to like grow their skills, this is part of it. You can go to school, you can take classes, you can read books, lots of exercises. But the thing is, it's an investment on both sides mm -hmm. to move forward with that. But like the biggest thing I've seen is people are afraid we're going to get rid of the job. No, we're going to give them the ability to start to focus on things that are more intriguing. I mean, testing is an art, right? And I think that manual testers, like there's some manual testers I work with, I don't ever want them to do test automation, but they're going to be like the first hire on any team that I work on because they're, they're so great at picking apart the domain and picking apart the system under test that it's hard to have automation learn. We are starting to see that with machine learning, but when it comes down to like my app, it's really easy for someone who is a great manual tester to really thrive, even with a lot of test automation support. Bill, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I think for, for us, over the past two years, we've, we've really turned to automation, and then the reluctancy to not automate has gone away. But when I first started, there was a reluctance. There was like, why are you forcing me to use this tool to write automation, and I don't want to use that one, I want to use this one, and, and all of that sort of, right? So with the, when we put out our test run manager, it makes it really easy for someone to run automation that doesn't have to write it. They could just click a button and run a suite, and they get the results. Now they're involved. They see it happening. So it's, and the other thing is, for us, it's, we, we want dev and QA to be one thing, and everyone does automation. And so we, but there's still the reluctance on the dev side, because it's like, oh, I, gotta, I gotta write the code, I gotta write the unit test, and now you want me to write automation too, and I gotta learn this framework, and I gotta do all the, right? So it's just trying to shift the culture and the mindset that no, dev also owns QA, and QA owns dev, and it's one thing. And you, you can't ship the product without quality, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. That's a perfect way to end it. I believe everybody in a development team owns quality. It's just not a QA effort. Everybody has a piece of that. And I think that's really a key piece to kind of take back in that sense. It's, it's not just a silo approach. I think it starts from your business analyst down to a product owner, a project manager, developers. They own a piece of that quality. And so, great way to finish that one, Phil. Questions are keep coming in here. Hello. Um, what Product, project, or uh, service have you introduced to your companies that have had the most value and the best uh, acceptance uh, as far as culture and, and return value? The, what project? Product. Like any products or any toolings that you've introduced to a Sauce team. Labs, dude. <laughs> right? That's yeah. it. Sauce Labs. <laughs> Go ahead. No, it's literally, I mean, like, all the browser stack? No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, oh, that's right. We're at SauceCon. Sauce. No, literally, um, this is the third time I've been to SauceCon. Well, this, there's been three SauceCons, so I've been to all of them. Okay. So, but every time I've come, I've taken something here, and we've applied it where, where I work. You know this. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, Sauce Labs. Any other cool tools that you've introduced to your teams? I think uh, CI, CD is, is one thing, which is making life very easier. That is a great thing. And a lot of these um, you know, analytical tools that we are introducing, that is great. That is bringing us closer to our user. We want to see how our users are doing, how they are you know, um, basically doing what, so that we can also simulate the same thing in our lower environment and you know, stuff like that. So, Any tools around? generating test data? Um, so for test data, we basically um, do a lot of different ways. The one thing that we do is basically dump the production data, of course, to our lower environment, because of course, we want to, close, we want to be close to, to the production. But of course, you, you have to remember there is PII data that you cannot just dump to the lower environment. 
So basically masking those data, we dump it, so use that uh, you know, uh, way to generate uh, data. So you're kind of seeding the database, everybody else doing the exact same thing, or is you doing mocking, or? No, we do seeding as well. Like we have snapshots of uh, production database, but scrub the PII and dump it into our feature environments and queue environments, yeah. We use scripting to create the data from scratch. Um, Calling the APIs? Sorry? Calling the APIs or like? Yeah, through APIs or right inside of the database using direct database calls. Um, we don't do that every time, but every so often it will, we'll do that and then create a snapshot of that. Um, we are really hesitant to use anything production specifically around the PII because we don't know the entire database. <laughs> So we don't want to fall into that trap, especially with uh, GDPR in play now, mm -hmm. um, with the European Union uh, yeah. data privacy rules. Uh, you can get heavily fined if uh, you have PII in your databases, so we just don't do that. Awesome. I'd, rather, I'd like to get back to the dashboard discussion real fast. Um, more and more at my company, we're seeing that teams want to utilize a dashboard for their purposes. and middle management and especially senior management want to use dashboard for their purposes and they're often not the same purposes. Sometimes they're even conflicting. Uh, do you guys have any advice for how you can get senior managers and middle managers to stop asking the question of why are you at 89.9% code coverage in your yellow? Like why can't you get that extra tenth of a percent coverage? And instead start asking the right questions of do you have the tests that give you the confidence to deploy correctly? Do you, are those tests written correctly? Are they maintainable tests? Instead of like, why are you not at that extra 0.1%? I can add to that. Uh, we adopted CI/CD last year, and that questions came in from our managers. So instead of looking at the quantity, they looked at the quality, like why the tests are not stable. And uh, you know, uh, with CI/CD, you have to test uh, before test before it's merged, uh, shift left, and. Uh, uh, you know how the tests are really flaky during those runs and nobody trusts our tests. So that's the question that came during uh, the conversation, like why the tests are not uh, stable, why the tests are not green, how, how, what can you do to make it green? So our test engineer group went through that whole process of uh, make green stable runs and they uh, I think for a few months they just were head down, writing automation as well as making, uh, you know, test table. So uh, I think uh, t shifting left will also help you as manager will ask you the, those questions. Like uh, instead of quantity, they will ask for quality. Yeah. Hey. Um, so everyone's hiring SDETs, right? Um, not many people are hiring functional testers anymore. What do you think makes um, a really good SDET? And what are the, the ways that you build or grow or recruit those people? Do you, do you find it better to build those skills in-house or try and recruit from them? What was the last part? I'm sorry. Do you, do you try and grow the skills for SDETs in-house or do you try and recruit an SDET? Hmm. I think that's a, a short question. <laughs> no. So. Um, I, I'm a, uh, I'm a, um, a software developer in test, uh, like I said. Um, so I think um, in this conference, in these three days, I've been talking to so many people. A lot of people are getting confused between an automation engineer and an estate. They think both are the same. But let me tell you, they, they both are not the same. Uh, Estet are basically, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if anyone watches cricket. So in, in, in cricket, you have like this baller, you have a batsman, and there is one, the super awesome guys, you know, who does both things. So Estet is basically, you know, have the mindset of, of a QA, but at the same time, he has this technical skill and, you know, can go through the dev code and just, you know, understand everything. Um, so uh, uh, for, for me, uh, when I see some test cases failing, I know that uh, where is this test case failing in, in devs code and I can find him, hey, this is the place your you know, test is failing. Um, now, the, the second question is, uh, are you making a step build in your organization? Definitely, this is one way you can do it. Because like I said, I was a manual tester before, automation engineer and an estate now. And I, this journey was in an organization. You know, I wasn't hired as an estate. Uh, 
then I'm not sure whether I'm sure people are also hiring Ested because they are they are you know those those people who are making creating tools and getting close to you know um, make your process faster as compared to what we had before. So I, I'm not sure whether how many people are starting hiring, but yes, definitely they are in demand at this point. So my, my question is more, like, that's all that people seem to be looking for. So we have clients say we need you know, X number 100 estets, and they, they, they're unicorns. They, there's not that many of them. And I so just wonder how you go about filling them in your organization. Do you recruit for them, or do you just find it more successful to build those skills? So what you do is you look to your left, and you have this guy <laughs> right here. <laughs> He's got some amazing material to get you started, but you are right. It's like trying to find someone that is a developer that wants to do testing. That's probably the most challenging piece when you get to the SDET side of it. Dave, do you have any tips? Because I know you help so many people, and I'm putting you on the spot here. <laughs> you could just send them to my website. <laughs> <laughs> that website. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, there's uh, elementalselenium.com and the Selenium Guidebook, which is at seleniumguidebook.com. So the panelists, have you checked out Dave's material? Oh, yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah. Has Dave's it been right. helpful in your yeah. career? It's cool. Yeah. What's that? Has it been helpful? Yeah, yeah, yes. totally. Yeah? yeah? I think the daily emails really help. I'm on well, Dave's yeah. emails all oh, the time. Most of the time, read those daily emails from the Elemental Selenium. Yeah. Show, yeah. The, show the people those hands. Is everybody signed up to Dave's material? Oh, wow. We're, <laughs> you're going to get some more traffic tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your, your website can scale. Yeah. <laughs> that might be a problem. Yeah, I, I wanted to chime in on the hiring the SDET issue. Right, so duo.com slash jobs, we're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, is, it is kind of difficult to find like, the right skills. And, and we're looking not for cultural fit. We're looking for someone who can help expand our culture. So we, we talk to a lot of people. And we tell a lot of people, thank you, but no thank you. Uh, but like the first thing we look for in an estate is what do your coding chops look like? All right, you got to be able to have solid logic. Um, I got kind of lucky at Duo. We use Python. I had never touched Python before. I have C Sharp. I got Java. I got Ruby. I got Perl. Python's not on the list. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that I showed them that I took the interview in Python. I did okay, I guess. But then they talked to me, and then I had like stories about what I like to do on the quality side and how I think automation can help different organizations, including Duo. All right, so it's really finding someone who's, who's passionate about being on the testing side, having the quality mindset. And we do try to encourage people from inside the company, if they want to learn those skills, we can set them up with training, uh, set them up with some pointers to like Dave's site or classes. Um, boot camps, there's lots of resources out there now that you don't necessarily need to have a hardcore CS degree. You can come from a lot of places. Um, some of the best engineers that we have at Duo actually have arts and sciences background. But what they bring to the table is a different way of thinking. And it kind of kind of goes into the uh, D&I talk from this morning, is that you don't need to have everybody thinking the same way. Having a diverse uh, pool of people, diverse thoughts uh, can really drive the system company to go further. If you're trying to find us, that's, it's really challenging, and this is based on my experience. Everybody goes through a technical exercise. They got to build this cash register, and then they got to test it. If they can't write a test, they're not a good fit. Um, in the sense from an automation side of it, um, that's kind of what we've done. Um, we're down to like a minute and 30 seconds. Well, I, I got a line of people. Everybody's taking the ticket. <laughs> Um, if you don't have a CI CD already there, like from the scratch you're starting, can uh, someone of you tell us like how did you start from the scratch like implementing and what kind of tests did you do like when you do CI CD, I know like you do smoke test, regression test, like what else you, did you do, uh, like any experience from you? I can jump in. Uh, so if you're starting from scratch, uh, identify the tasks that are more critical to you. Uh, 
see if you can run it uh, outside of your local machine, like run on Jenkins, uh, run on uh, any test runner outside, uh, integrate uh, your test with uh, feature environments. Uh, that would be important because uh, for CI you are running before it merge, uh, before the commit merges to you know uh, master. So it's very important to run those automation tests before uh, uh, you merge it. And also, like it's very important when a feature is developed, uh, you develop your test automation as well. So that's where uh, CI/CD comes in and matures uh, the CI/CD. So those are the really uh, good factors that you can consider uh, if you're building CI/CD from scratch. And also, if you're writing the test infrastructure, uh, make sure you're using your infrastructure as a code. So use uh, Docker containers to run your tests. Use uh, Selenium Grid to run your tests uh, so it can be faster. Uh, Sauce Lab for cross-browser testing and just build something that is more flexible and expandable and uh, easy to use. We are out of time. <laughs> there were so many good questions. I appreciate the panelists for everything. I only have three sweatshirts. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand first. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> As have Greg's a large. handing out the sweatshirts, sweatshirts, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, craft Beer Break is in the Expo Hall from 3.05 to 3.55. And please come back to join us in the keynotes at 4 o'clock to hear our esteemed Thomas Boyles. Oh, wait, no, there's one more session. I'm sorry, from 2.30 to 3.05. My bad. Um, so at 2.30, uh, Titus will be here doing page objects. You're doing it wrong. So if you want to come and hear how you can do it right, please join me back here at 2.30. And give a lovely round of applause for our Aussians. Um, great questions. <laughs>